This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, a clinical psychologist, and I, about six years ago, decided to extend the walls of my practice to many people I've never met, but to those of you who might be very interested already in psychological and emotional issues, maybe you're in therapy, to those of you who've just been diagnosed or you're having a loved one that's having a problem or you yourself are experiencing some kind of mental or emotional problem that you need help with, but also to a third group of you. Many are out there I know that think, oh, I don't know, therapy's kind of weird, and I just think people who can't solve their own problems go to therapists. Let me tell you, that's not true. But if you want to listen to self-work, and I hope you do, then maybe you can learn more about what therapy might really be like. Self-work isn't therapy, but it's a pretty good sampling of what you might hear from other psychologists or mental health professionals. So after all that, (laughs) welcome to self-work. It's a special weekend here in the United States as we celebrate Independence Day, and this whole podcast is geared toward first responders. Self-work listeners have already been the recipient of Doc Shauna Springer's wisdom when I interviewed her about her book, Warriors, which was all about treatment for PTSD and survivor guilt or depression and anxiety after military service. She's a renowned expert in her field and highly respected by the warriors she treats, knowing how to use their language and steeping herself in their experiences to gain trust. So when she got the idea to do another book geared to treating trauma in first responders, she took matters in her own hands, reaching out to her friend Michael Sugru, a highly trained soldier and a veteran of the police force. I need to say that the violence in this book is very real, so if you have trauma or violence in your past, please read with caution, and we do talk about it here on this podcast, so listen carefully as well. Michael hadn't experienced PTSD from his years spent in an elite Air Force squad, but he did after serving as a police officer. One night, he killed a young man who was lunging at him with a butcher knife, with the screams of the man's intended victims, his roommates, piercing the air. That tragic event, as well as the years afterwards spent in court battles and coupled with intense personal loss, caused Michael to have to fight to stay alive, as every day and night he was besieged by nightmares and flashbacks, night after night seeing the distorted face of the man he'd killed. It was only after one of his best friends attempted suicide, his friend was also a cop, he felt such guilt because he finally realized he couldn't do something that would hurt his daughter forever, like dying by suicide, and he sought help. What you may not know is that suicide kills more first responders each year than die in the line of duty. This is one of many things that need to change. Doc Springer and Michael also want you to know, as do I, that this story and its powerful message has nothing to do with choosing sides. That belief is that you have to side either with the police or or with protesters, and that does not need to be. Instead, there can be compassion for all so that solutions, ideas for positive change, can emerge from that compassion and understanding. In fact, what this book, Relentless Courage, is doing is trying to help those of us who aren't first responders to feel, to recognize the trauma that those that do serve face every day, and to build into especially the police culture that their personal trauma and injury needs to be recognized so that there can be more support while they're serving as police. Now, before we hear from Doc Springer and Michael, let's hear an offer from BetterHelp. It just might be time for you to get help yourself. And BetterHelp has an offer for you as a self-work listener. I'm proud to say that BetterHelp has been a sponsor of self-work for more than two years now. They're ranked often as number one when compared with other professional therapeutic online services and do their best to match you with a therapist that you'll feel gets you, is attuned to you, and with whom you can find the kind of help and healing you need. You can do video sessions, you can text, because BetterHelp wants to offer you the most accessible and private therapy they can. Their therapists are licensed professionals. In fact, I've received offers from BetterHelp to become one of their therapists, but self-work keeps me busy. So if you need services that are financially affordable and convenient, 
then trying BetterHelp may be the best choice you've ever made for yourself. And you get 10% off your first month of services if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash self-work. You know, I'm a therapist because I got good therapy, because I learned the immense value of hearing another experienced and knowledgeable perspective on my own life from someone that cared and was invested in my getting better. So try BetterHelp and get one month at a 10% discount. BetterHelp.com slash self-work. I offer this episode for this very patriotic weekend as we all move forward to understand the pain of all trauma and strive for compassion and understanding instead of distrust and disdain. And if you are or know a first responder, whether it's police, fire, paramedics, whatever it is, this might be the episode that you or they most need to hear. So I want to introduce Dr. Shauna Springer to you once again, and I'm also delighted to have Michael Sugru as a guest. So I'm delighted at Self Work today to welcome Doc Shauna Springer, who has been on this program before, and uh, I feel like I'm getting to know her, but also Michael Sugru, who is really the topic of the book. His life, his story is the major topic of the book, and then Shauna Springer has also brought all of her experience with PTSD and uh, warriors, that her work with warriors to the fore as well. So I am delighted to have you both. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Margaret. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I would like to start at the last first. Is that okay okay with you? Because in the chapter, The Future of Law Enforcement, by the way, the book is called Relentless Courage, Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma. And it is number one. It's a New York Times bestselling book. We would love for it to be a New York Times bestselling book. It is an Amazon bestselling book. Oh, that's right. Not, not a New York eight, Times. Eight, okay. eight weeks straight. So um, Amazon. I don't think we're quite on the radar for New York Times, but if anybody listening <laughs> would like to consider us for that, I would love that. I just don't Amazon want to misrepresent. <laughs> well, I think you should be a New York Times bestselling book. Thank so you. There you go. But what you say is, when it comes to supporting communities of color and those who serve in law enforcement roles, there's incredible pressure to choose a side, quote unquote. I cannot and will not choose a side. I'm a trauma psychologist, and I care deeply about both communities. I was, I was very touched that you included that, and I, that's why I wanted to start out with this, because I want both of you to talk about how you're addressing this you know, people feel like it's some sort of dichotomy. You've got to be on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence. And I thought maybe you could talk about that a little bit. I'm going to set Michael up to talk about this okay. by sharing that I got an email last week from somebody that works out at his gym that he's known for years. And it was the most beautiful, heartfelt email I've had in a long time. And he said, I'm not a first responder, not a military veteran. I had another job, a civilian job, and I read your book because I'm African-American and Michael and I had sort of known each other, but had not really had a deep conversation. And this book changed my perception of the kinds of traumas first responders face. I knew they had hard jobs, but I truly didn't understand the kinds of things they see and the kinds of things they're faced with. Um, And he and Michael went to coffee. And they had this deep and long conversation where he shared his own pain and Michael shared his. And it was really, I want to have Michael talk about that because I wasn't there for that conversation. But that's part of why we wrote this book, because we're not going to take a side. We um, deeply care about both communities and the pain of everyone who suffered from trauma. Do Do you want to share about that, Michael? It was such a cool development. Absolutely. So um, I work out every day. It's part of my routine and part of my recovery from post-traumatic stress. And there's a gentleman who I had seen for years and we had at some point said hi to each other, but we didn't really know each other. And he didn't know I was in law enforcement and I didn't really know his background. And so I approached him one day and told him, you know, about what I had done in the book. And I said, look, I I really want your honest opinion on this book. 
no holds barred. I said, you know, Doc Springer and I, we wrote this book for a couple of reasons. You know, the first reason was to, to simply save the lives of our first responders, the ones who are suffering in silence and dying by suicide every single day. Yes. And I said, second to that, but just as important is to really bring down the mask, the mm-hmm. wall behind law enforcement and all first responders for that matter, because the facts are that, you know, we have this uniform on, we have this image, we kind of put up a front, a feeling that we're invincible, nothing phases us, right. nothing bothers us. And it couldn't be farther from the truth because the facts are that we're human and that we see hundreds of traumatic incidents. You know, we get called on people's worst days and we don't have a choice. We have to show up and we have to deal with these horrific events. And so when I approached this gentleman, I said, look, you know, I I don't want you to sugarcoat this. I want you to just really tell me your honest thoughts about this book, what your feedback is. And so it was really cool is that I would see him as he was reading this and he read it over a week period. And every time I saw him, he, he just, he started talking and we had this conversation and I could just see his eyes lighting up and, and really I knew right away that this was going to be good. And I knew right away, but what he told me was, he said, look, he said, when I get done with this book, he's like, you and I need to sit down, you know, over food or coffee. And he's like, I want to share with you my life experiences. And I want to share with you where I came from and how we're different, but how we're also very similar. And, you know, one thing I have to tell you that really bothered me was he did share some stories of some very negative law enforcement contacts Mm -hmm. uh, with him and with his family and specifically with with his daughter. And I'm a father of a young daughter. And when I heard the story, it literally made me cringe. I mean, I, I felt horrible. And I truly put myself in his shoes and his place and tried to to feel what he would feel. And and I couldn't imagine it, to be honest with you. And so this book is going to help change perceptions of law enforcement because we don't do a good job of bringing people in. We keep everybody out. And I think a key part of improving law enforcement relations and the community is really just showing them who we really are, that we are human, Mm -hmm. that we do suffer, that we do care. You know, we're willing to put our lives on the line every single day for complete strangers. And when horrific things like, you know, I talk about in this book happen, and when I was put in a very horrific situation that changed my life forever, I truly want people to understand the impact of that, that these things do bother us and that we do care. Yes. You know, in the book, you say that's very eloquently put, by the way, and I'm so glad you had that experience. It it sounds like maybe that's another book, actually. (laughs) But, you know, you point out, and I knew this from talking to Shauna before, but that suicide kills more police than in the direct line of duty. And so Mm -hmm. that's astounding. And and yet there's a quote in the book said the mental warfare is never discussed. Their, your own internal mental warfare. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you're talking about. And I, I've i had a, a modicum of experience uh, with some paramedics and some firefighters. I tried to search through my memory, had I ever treated a police officer? And I do not think I have. But I, I certainly got the gist of some of that, about the humor and how it's handled and all that kind of thing that what was a part of your world and still is very much a part of your story and your history. One of the things, before we get, Michael, to your military service, I'd like for Shauna to talk some, and, and you call her Doc, which is, of course, a a sign of how much you trust her, and I think it's wonderful. Shauna, you talk in the book about the difference between trauma and moral injury, mm-hmm. and I was, I think that's a really important concept to, before we start telling more of the story so sure. that we can distinguish you know, which is which. And because I just, I thought the distinction between those two things was very important to understand. I agree. I agree. And one of the things I've seen you do really well in your work with perfectly hidden depression is really look at differentials, you know, really pinning things down. What is what? So trauma is related to a sense of our safety in the world. You know, when we feel like we're not safe or we can't navigate our environment or people can't really be trusted, you know, to keep us safe. 
Sometimes it comes from one event that causes helplessness or horror. For first responders, it's an accumulation of hundreds of events that they're exposed to, where they see the worst in humanity over and over again, and it changes their worldview. And they try to navigate these two worlds, the world that they see that most of us don't when they're on duty and their home life, try to kind of be this loving partner and parent, but it's, it's an emotional whiplash. Sure. So that's trauma. It's related to safety. Moral injury is not the same thing. Someone can have both or one or the other. Moral injury is a sense that there's a shame or a feeling of moral contamination because of something that you've done or been pulled into, whether you chose it or not. And that's often the case. Oh, I like that and, word, contamination. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting thing because when you talk about you haven't treated a law enforcement officer, but you've treated firefighters, they all see tremendous trauma, tremendous trauma. The moral injury quotient for law enforcement officers is different. Just had a conversation with, with an officer the other day about how they don't really wear their uniforms when they're off duty. They're kind of like Vietnam veterans, a lot of them. My patients were like, when they were out, they ripped off their uniforms and they concealed that part of their identity, because we as a society have started to treat them like we did our Vietnam veterans, as though they're all presumed corrupt or abusers of power, right. you know, until proven otherwise. Whereas with firefighters and other first responders, there's still kind of a general positive feeling that people have. So I think in particular within the first responder world, there can be some moral injuries that people can experience when good people are treated as though they are not good people um, or when they're treated as though the things that they do in Michael's case, he had to take a life. Someone attacked him and his fellow officers with a butcher knife after attempting to murder his roommates after being unresponsive to officer commands to put the weapon down. Um, And yet Michael was sued and Michael was, really put through some experiences that made me angry to write about it Sure, because we became friends through this process. And I had to review all of the cases, everything from the legal stuff to the depositions to all of it. And um, those are moral injuries when you're assumed to be guilty or pulled into something that you may not have had a choice in, but you're treated as though you've done something shameful. Michael, do you want to speak to that? Because that was so obvious and very poignant in the book about your own just um, angst and anguish about being perceived this way. And yet you're also, what? let me see, I don't have it right here. You said you can logically know you're not at fault, but the loss of power is terrifying. I thought that was a really interesting quote. Can you talk about that, Michael? You know, you know, Doc Springer summed it up very well, um, you know, but the facts are, is, you know, we, we have to make split second decisions. And sometimes these are life and death situations and inaction can cost lives, but action can also cost lives. And in my case, you know, I was forced into a situation that I I didn't want to be in. I had no choice. And had I not been there, I know lives would have been lost. And so I know definitively that when this incident happened, you know, we did the right thing. We saved lives. But on top of that, you know, to be sued, to go through depositions for four years, to have to relive this event day in and day out. And and literally, you can't forget a detail. I mean, everything is on the line. And so I have to know every single detail, study it and, and, you know, to have basically be attacked again. It's like I was attacked in that condominium when the suspect came down with a butcher knife and then I was attacked again you know, by the legal system, by the public. And it was just a relentless attack. And the facts are that right or wrong, even though I know we save lives, I have to live with the fact that I took a human life. Yes, that's what I'm, the point I wanted you to get to, because I think you obviously went through a horrific process of four years, by the way, and your personal life was falling apart. Your stepfather died. I mean, there was so much that happened. But at the same time, you know, I think you would have gone through some of this just because you were forced to take a life. Absolutely. And and I'm still dealing with it today. You know, I will deal with this for the rest of my life. It has had an impact. 
It has forever changed me. And I wish I could have gone back and had magical powers and, you know, prevented this from happening, but I, I didn't have that. And it did happen. And, and that's what I want people listening and watching to know is that this wasn't just one event that happened and I moved on with my life and I forgot about it. I literally will think about this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You bring up memory and the memories of all these things that happen. And the the gentleman in your preface, I believe his name was Dr. Uh, Dave Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Mm -hmm. uh, talked about how it's a part of trauma that you have memory gaps and, and tunnel vision and, you know, you can't remember things quite right. And, and yet you have to count on that memory and it being concrete. You have to say the first thing and the third thing and the 17th thing and the 717th thing has to be the same, or you're considered, Oh, is he lying? Or is he being, you know, uh, not being truthful. And yet by the very, <laughs> the very fabric of trauma is such where there are rips and tears and all that kind of thing. So that just exactly. seemed to me to be something I thought about, but you just highlighted it so well. Yeah, it's a critical point. You know, if you've got somebody on trial and their credibility is on the line and they're expected to remember everything with the kind of pinpoint accuracy that often law enforcement officers depend on mm -hmm. to remember a call, but that call that affects you personally, where you're the target sure. of a life threat, it's different. You know, it's different. And that was, I think, the only chapter where I really came out of my kind of position as a, here's a psychologist, I'm commenting on what I really think. I really felt moved in that chapter to talk about an attempted assault I had experienced when I was in college. So I had this like, I don't want to go into it in detail because it really, you know, the whole story focuses around Michael, but this was a way that I wanted to have his back. I had a conversation with my sister about how many times have we both had to run for our lives or to prevent ourselves from being sexually assaulted. Men experience that to some degree, but I think not as often as women. Mm -hmm. And I remembered this time when I had been assaulted and um, it wasn't completed. Um, I was, you know, in martial arts at the time and immediately, thankfully, kind of went to how can I defend myself? How can I hurt him? Get away. But I lost memory of that night of how I got home and I didn't tell anybody about it for like 20 years. And so I really understand when somebody gets assaulted that they don't have recall of some of the events that happened and that they want to just lock it down. You know, like, what was my fear rational? Like, if I had come forward, did I think I would get in trouble somehow? I don't even know. I just knew I, I couldn't talk about it. And my heart was hammering for a long time. And then I said, I'm going to bury this one. And I think that's our natural human tendency. But Michael didn't have that choice because mm -mm. everything that he did was known and scrutinized and attacked repeatedly. And then his memory had to be the basis for defending everything he had, including his family, his future, his retirement. And yet memory, as you said, it's very fractured with trauma. So, Michael, I'm, I'd be curious as to what other police officers have, have people who are actively in the force still reached out to you because you describe both of you describe very well this breakdown of, of any kind of personal uh, claiming of, of this is hard for me or whatever. I mean, to say that is om almost overly simplistic on my part. I wonder if police officers themselves have reached out to you. Absolutely. I, I receive messages almost on a daily basis literally from around the world. I mean, you know, UK, Australia, and the facts are that I'm not unique. I'm not special. And the things that we talk about in this book resonate with countless first responders. I mean, countless. And so a lot of the messages that I get are basically, you know, the realization that they're not alone. When they read this book, they realize that, oh my gosh, like I, I had these same feelings. Mm -hmm. I've gone through these same experiences. You know, their incidents may not be the exact same, but they may be similar. But what is the same is their feelings and the suffering and silence and the stigma of asking for help. Mm 
And that's what I hear over and over is that people are scared they're alone and they feel like they're the only one who feels this way. They're the only one who understands what it is that they're going through. And so this book is truly giving people hope and the chance to see that they're not alone, that there are other people out there just like them. And, you know, more importantly to that is that what we show in this book is that there is help. I mean, there's endless resources out there, things I didn't know about until I started this journey. But more importantly than that is there's hope and there's a whole new life on the other side of this. You can get better and you can make it through this. And and that's the key to this whole thing is that people are now getting hope and they're seeking help because of this book. That's wonderful to realize. And I'm, I'm glad you've heard from fellow officers who are being, you know, supportive and, and grateful to both of you for this. I want to touch on a little bit about your training and you being this elite force in the military and how you see that as having perhaps might have influenced you in a direction that seeking help might have been just even further out of sight rather than just being a, a, in the police force. I mean, because you had years of this, uh, you were a part of what's called the Phoenix Ravens. You know, and I think it's actually bigger than that. I, I can remember going into the Air Force as a brand new butter bar, second lieutenant, and right out of college, you know, I had a it's little a bit of life. Bar. <laughs> uh, well, we call it, we call it a butter bar, but that's a second lieutenant because the gold bar that you have on on your shoulder. Oh. So um, I understand it now. You know, I didn't appreciate the comment when I was brand new, but I, I get it now. And um, you know, literally, you're thrown to the wolves. And on day one, my first assignment, I was in charge of sixty people. You know, in charge of protecting nuclear weapons site dispersed in in two different states and. The pressure, the immense pressure behind that to have to be that leader, to always set the example, to be the picture of perfection and strength and courage. And so in some ways, I do think that played a part in this, you know, because I just felt like I couldn't screw up. I couldn't break down. I had to be the perfect person. And and that's part of my personality, even growing up, is, is striving for perfection and feeling like, you know, everything had to be in line. And so I I do think the military played a part in reinforcing the stigma of asking for help, for sure. Um, But what I do think is interesting is that none of my post-traumatic stress comes from my military service. It actually all originates from my law enforcement career. And I think, you know, for the public listening to this, I think it's widely accepted that, you know, veterans, especially combat veterans, they might get post-traumatic stress. I mean, the public understands it. They support it. They almost expect it. But what they don't realize is that our first responders, especially law enforcement, we're literally in combat every single day. And we're talking 20, 30 years in a career. And so what I'm really hoping is that this is going to shed light on the public to show them that, well, you accept this among our military warriors, our combat veterans, but why isn't this as accepted amongst our warriors on the streets, our first responders? Oh, that's such an important point. And I keep flashing back in my own mind to, I'm from Northwest Arkansas, and there's several cities that are grouped together. And uh, there had been a Black Lives Matter um, protest about George Floyd in one of the other towns and it had not gone well. It had led to conflict and between the police and the, and the protesters. But when it happened in my hometown in Fayetteville, there was a lot of alarm about what might go on. And, and the, uh, the police officers kneeled and it was such a show of support and empathy. And then the, the protesters started talking to the police officers and, mm. and it was this, I mean, it was just a a genuine moment of I got chills just now. We want to understand one another, you know, and that's really where we need to be. And I was not there, sadly, but I I talked to several people that were and um, I was delighted that that's what happened in my community. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about, Michael, that you actually became suicidal. 
you had been abandoned by your own biological father and you had this wonderful man named Mike Cromley that was like your father and, and your stepdad. And, and, and he was so proud of, he was also a police officer and all that. Um, I mean, it, it was just a warm, loving, incredibly moving story. But what you feared a lot, you said you really, you did not tell your wife and it ended in a lot of conflict and then eventually divorce, but that you were afraid you'd lose your daughter. But can you share with us a little bit about what it was like to walk around and struggle so much with these these ideas of all this would be over if I, if I just, and I'd be memorialized if I were killed in the line of duty? You know, um, the thing is, I never had an active thought of suicide in, in the I guess, general sense that people mostly think of, which is, you know, taking your own life actively at home or, or, or some other place like that. And what I did, though, is I, I wanted to literally die in the line of duty. So you can think of it as the opposite of suicide by cop. So suicide by a bad guy. And it, it seems like it almost doesn't make sense, but I had this constant fear of dying. And that started the moment I was almost killed in that condominium when the man with a knife tried to kill me. But then there was this fear that because I was going to die, my daughter would never know who her father was, that she would never know how much I loved her, that all memory of me would be erased. And when I was going through this horrific divorce process, that exacerbated that because then I had this fear in my mind that and it was unwarranted and it wasn't true. These were things I was making up in my own head, but it was that, you know, my ex-wife would erase all memory of me and she wouldn't have done that. But in my mind at the time, that's all I can think of. And I was tired of suffering. I was tired of the pain. Literally, I couldn't find relief. There's nobody I could talk to. I didn't have any resources that I trusted or that I knew about. And I truly thought the only way out was if I died in the line of duty, at least I would be remembered as a hero to my daughter. At least my memory would sustain and she would always know who I was. And that's how dark I got. And the thing is, is that this happens more than we can even imagine. I mean, as a perfect example, we hear stories all the time of a solo police car into a tree and the officer wasn't wearing a seatbelt or into a sound wall. Mm -hmm. And there's these incidents that happen on duty in the line of duty, but how many of these are actually suicides where officers just don't want to be here anymore? And that's where I was at. That's how bad the suffering was. So are you saying those are likely to be suicides or they were likely? Yes. Okay. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. They are. Suicide is the biggest threat and the blind spot of first responders. As a therapist, you know, therapist to therapist here, this would not have been captured by a therapist. Mm-mm. Michael was not suicidal by the training that we receive. If somebody had asked him, are you suicidal? Do you have a plan to hurt or kill yourself? He would have said no and been totally honest. And then I think, oh, my goodness, that conversation then would have gone to, oh, he actually has this fear of death. She wasn't actually a fear of death. It was a fear of being obliterated and forgotten by his daughter. Which but, is kind of death. Yeah. But a therapist would have said Oh, that's in the category of what keeps him alive. How could somebody with a fear of death want to take their own life? Yet on the job, he was deeply suicidal and he was pursuing reckless risks that would have gotten him killed. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the suicide data that we have for law enforcement, it's wildly inaccurate because a lot of these on-duty deaths are not accurately captured, I believe based on my work with first responders as a trusted doc um, who's really gotten to know this tribe. And it's alarming to me that therapists wouldn't, we wouldn't pick up on this and they wouldn't be lying. You know, they'd be saying in good faith, no, I'm not suicidal, but it can quickly build to a head. And when they are suicidal, they're not coding that as suicidality, right? They're just rushing into risky situations in a kind of, um, way with some heat behind them that they don't really analyze and get help for. That's got to stop. 
you're preaching to the choir here about how yeah. perfectionism can be a camouflage for a lot of despair. But this is added yeah. to that is this kind of like you say, this fuel that mm-hmm. is even unconscious, perhaps, but is mm-hmm. pushing someone forward to do something like this very not necessarily impulsively, but just um, recklessly. It's under the guise of bravery or yeah. fulfilling the hero role, but it's actually suicidality in disguise. Mm-hmm. And I think this happens way more often than most people appreciate. And that's, I think, a really critical part of what we wanted to bring forward with this book. There's another theme, to switch gears just a little bit, that I especially want to address is the existence of evil and the that some people seem to want to believe, need to believe evil doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And yet um, you said in the book, Shauna, that you have looked in the eyes of a sociopath. So have I, and it's not something you forget. No, evil exists. Yes. Yes. And so can one or both of you talk about that? You want to take this one first, Michael? I do. Um, If you want to look at the news recently, school shooting that just happened. I mean, you want to talk about pure evil. I mean, that is pure evil and it exists it's out there every single day. And the thing is, who is going to face this evil? Who is the last line? When you call 911, who has to show up? Who has to take care of that? We do. No one else is coming. And, you know, the thing is, is there's on the flip side of this. And, I, and I've learned this through my recovery because I used to be a very black and white person. And it was the old me was, hey, you broke the law. You're a bad person. You're going to jail. And I now know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. The case is in reality that we have so many people out there suffering with their own issues, their own trauma, and they're turning Mm -hmm. to drugs and they're committing, you know, thefts and and petty crimes and and things like that. That's not evil. Mm -hmm. These are people that are suffering who are making poor decisions based on their circumstances. Pure evil is different. It's different. That is what nobody wants to acknowledge. Nobody wants to believe exists, but it's out there. Yes, it is. And I've seen it. I've seen it up close in my face. And it's something I'll never forget. And it's the reason today I still have nightmares. I still can't get this face out of my dreams. I think there are a lot of people in our society that somehow go through most, if not all of their lives without ever having an encounter with evil. You know, they have encounters of people who do things that are not awesome, <laughs> you know, who, who make terrible decisions and hurt other people from their own pain and woundedness and trauma and all kinds of different motivations. But evil is also there. And our war fighters see it up close. The stench of it, they smell it. Our first responders see it up close. Um, and sometimes as therapists, you know, when we sit across from it, we see it. And we feel it and the the room changes Mm -hmm. um, and you just feel like in a different situation or maybe in this situation, I'd be your prey Um, because there's no person there to connect with. They've just gone. There's no soul there with, unfortunately, with some people. Now, it's not a lot of people, but when you work in certain professions, you see disproportionate amounts of it because of what you get called out to and you don't forget it and it changes your emotional reality in terms of what's possible. And I think law enforcement officers um, and to some degree, other first responders feel that um, the world is, is less safe than they thought because they've encountered this and their life could be in danger every call they take. And when you have to think that way, it changes how you respond to people and how you guard and protect yourself. You have to. Um, and that has other implications for lots of things like your relationships at home or with other people or or just enjoying life like many of us get to do without that sort of filter of what is this person? Who is this person really? Right. It's more than sobering. <laughs> And maybe it's just too frightening for some people to imagine. Mm -hmm. And yet, like I say, I have been afraid (laughs) to look in someone's eyes and so and to see what I saw. So, Michael, one of the things that you talk about that was such an important turning point, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 
after you had been found not guilty or whatever the terminology is for you had not done anything wrong in the line of duty, but you still were suffering with a great deal of these ideas about your life ending and losing your daughter and that kind of thing. And a good friend of yours tried to die by suicide. And that sort of woke you up to, wait a minute, I can't do this. Can you talk about that a little bit? I can. So, you know, during this four years of suffering, I literally told myself that once this federal trial was over, that my life would magically get better and everything would go away. And I I truly believe that. And the thing was, is that the trial actually made things much, much worse because I sat there for two weeks in this courtroom with everything on the line and hearing these crazy theories by the plaintiffs that we were cold blooded murderers, that we planted evidence that this person was never armed. And then to be there in the courtroom with the identical twin brother, you know, seeing that same face that, must have been awful. That, that literally tried to kill me that, you know, literally today I can't get out of my nightmares. And so to be exposed to that and, you know, so I had that initial relief when we were found not guilty, we prevailed. And immediately that next morning when I woke up, I realized that things were actually getting much, much worse. They weren't getting better. And so that ended September, 2016. And then fast forward to November of 2016, about a week after Thanksgiving that year, I was on duty and my best friend, he's a Vietnam veteran. He was also a 35 year reserve officer. Um, We rode together almost every day for over 10 years. He actually tried to take his own life when I was on duty and I, I made it to the trauma center just as they brought him in covered in blood. He was in and out of consciousness and I didn't think he was going to make it. And I sat there in the hospital for hours with his sister and with my command staff. And all I could think about was the guilt and the shame that I had for not seeing how much he was suffering for not realizing how dark he had gotten, you know, sure. I asked him how he was doing. I would check in, but I do what all first responders do. And I just take that surface answer and I go with it. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. Okay. And so I did that, you know, for weeks. And when I looked back, I started looking at all the the signs and the indicators and, and started blaming myself. You know, why didn't I do something about this? And all I could think about was my daughter and, and how is she going to feel if I'm not here? Is she going to blame herself? Is she going to live with these feelings for the rest of her life? And so about a month after that is when I finally got the strength and courage to ask for help. And thank God he's alive today, but he saved my life Mm -hmm. by trying to take his own life. And I remind him of that every time I talk to him because he still has so much shame and guilt for what he did. But the reality is he saved my life. Wow. So tell me about therapy. Tell me about the group that you were a part of, that you were part of for quite a few years. I know this is a hard question to ask, but can you summarize in some ways what you learned about yourself, what you had to rethink, what you had to refeel, what you had to re-experience in order to heal? That's a really good question, I think. Well, thank you. You know, the the key to this whole thing was I got connected very early on with a culturally competent therapist. And, you know, I didn't know her personally, but the first day we met, I was very nervous. I was very apprehensive. And the first thing she did was she shared a very deep, dark, personal story of her life, something that happened many years earlier before she became a therapist. And when she told me that story, I knew immediately that I could trust her with my life. I knew that I could tell her anything and she would understand it. More importantly, she was living proof that you can actually come out the other side of this. I mean, to understand what she went through and I'm not comparing here, but it was horrific. Mm -hmm. And to see the strong woman in front of me who is now helping me was living proof that I could do this. Yes. That was absolutely pivotal to my journey. It was absolutely pivotal to my recovery is having that trusted, safe environment where you can share everything and anything that's on your mind and know that you're not going to be judged and that they're going to understand it. And what she did was she immediately connected me with these first responder support group meetings. And they're not affiliated with any agencies. 
They're just an hour long discussion meeting. They're held off site. They're open to any first responders. So firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers. And so I started going to these and the first few meetings, I didn't talk. I just listened. But what I realized, and that's where I realized for the first time was that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't unique, that my brothers and sisters and all these different first responder career fields were having the same thoughts, were having the same feelings. And that was where the power was, was realizing there are so many other people out there that I can now talk to, that I can trust, that I can open up to. But the ironic thing about this whole thing is that what about the brothers and sisters that I was working with, sure. that I was out there with on the front lines? Why couldn't I open up to them? Why couldn't I trust them to share what I was going through? Because I didn't. I never did. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. And that's what we need to change about this whole thing is we need to change this culture. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm really sorry about that. I, I couldn't wait to say what I was going to say. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it sounds like the belief system that you want to challenge is that it's impossible to do that concurrently, that kind of work concurrently when you are an active police officer, an active first responder, that somehow there is a belief that you've got to shore all that up or lock it away or never admit it or never talk about it versus what you're saying now is it would be possible for there to be support for this sort of personal sharing while at the same time still facing the evil and the people making bad choices and the addictions and everything that police officers have to deal with, that what you're saying is strongly is that you don't, those things could happen simultaneously. Absolutely. It's 100% what I'm saying is that we need to change this culture and we can do both because what I told myself early on and I still hear people say today is that I've got to be detached. I can't acknowledge my feelings. I can't admit that any of this stuff bothers me. And you can tell yourself that, but it is bothering you and it is taking a toll. And if you're not addressing it, it's going to get to my point, which was far too late. And you're going to, you're going to go over the edge. And what I'm advocating for and saying and Doc Springer saying is that if we normalize this and we start talking about this in the training academies and we carry that out through our through our career and we just make it normal, it doesn't have to be this huge thing. Then we can get through a full 20, 30 year career and come out healthy, both mentally and physically on the other side. Absolutely. We can do this. Shauna, you're nodding your head up and down. Yeah, I want to defer to Michael because, you know, he's been in the profession for many years, but I think it has to start early and it has to have the right leadership from the when the leaders are willing to create that space of authenticity and talk about some of their own challenges and struggles. They carve out the space for everybody else to come right into that place of truth telling. You know, I think this is about truth telling. And the reason the book is Relentless Courage is because with warfighters and first responders, it takes more courage for them to drop their emotional armor and talk about what's really going on. Talk about the things that are eating them from the inside out. Mm. And it takes a different kind of courage. And it's time to have that kind of courage because the cost of it is so clear. When they lose more to suicide than to line of duty deaths, we cannot refuse to look at this and have a call for that kind of courage all the way from the academies and training and the culture of how we set up support. But until that's created and in certain departments that don't have that kind of um, powerful, authentic leadership, then they need places like the First Responder Support Network, the West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat, these safe circles with docs who get it and fellow first responders who can help take them through their trauma. So they need both until we get there fully, but I think it's possible to get there. Is there somewhere, I mean, not everybody lives on the West Coast, and so is there somewhere where there is a, a website or where these kinds of support groups are listed? Absolutely. So in the back of our book, we have a whole listing of different resources that are located all over the United States, different hotlines, text lines, um, but also with the First Responder Support Network. If you go on their website, they do have a resources link and there's a PDF for some of these meetings, not all of them, 
But my, my best advice is to take advantage of the hotlines and the text lines in the back of our books. And a lot of those are geographic and they can connect you with your local resources and things like this. Great suggestion. So to, to summarize or to conclude, what have the two of you learned together that really you couldn't have learned without the other one? Another good question, Margaret. <laughs> um, you know, for me, one of the things I've learned is that a lot of the, there's like this migration of what I've understood about warfighters, warriors, into the first responder tribe. It feels really neat to me to have served this group of people that's self-sacrificial, very brave for many years, people who took a military oath. Michael represents both groups. And as a result of this friendship and partnership and collaboration, he has brought me into this other tribe of people who are suffering and for whom I feel we can offer so much in terms of life-changing insights about moral injury, survivor guilt, shame, grief, uh, relationship problems, transition is an issue that affects military and law enforcement and first responders, firefighters, all of them. And so I think that's one of my lessons is that with some adaptations, there's a lot of commonality between the two groups. And I really have a deep understanding of that now and a clear vision for how I think we can help them. I also think it for me personally was humbling to realize that everything Michael experienced, all these traumas, I mean, I know trauma, But these were traumas that happened miles from where I was sleeping at night that I had no awareness of. Right. So that was a humbling realization for me. When we talk about civilians are protected from the depth of the trauma that first responders see, that was a very personal realization for me during this whole writing journey. Michael would share with me and I would have to step inside of his story and his voice and write his story. He wrote too many reports. So I would I would write up his story in his voice and say, did I get it right? Um, and we would have this back and forth process that was really humbling to me to learn about all the traumas that happened right here in the wonderful place I live. I love the city where I live. It's a good city, very low crime, great quality of life. And there are people working every night and all day doing things I had no awareness of. So that those were, for me, some of the big lessons. And then the suicidality, the mental mindset of people and that risk that they're missing in their blind spot, I urgently want to get to that um, and change the culture. What about you, Michael? What was kind of, what did you take away from our collaboration? Well, you know, the first thing is, you know, and I have to give Doc Springer credit, is that, you know, I didn't envision any of this happening. And... You know, I part of me wanted to do a book and and part of me thought to myself, look, nobody's going to want to read this. Nobody's really going to care about it. And Doc Springer came to me and she's like, look, your story is going to resonate with so many people. And Mm -hmm. and this book is literally going to save lives. And so, you know, Doc made this a reality. And the reality of this is, is that this is much bigger than me. And this is. Mm -hmm saving many lives, but it's going to save many more lives. And so what I've learned really is how much work we can do together between first responders, veterans, and our therapists and clinicians, the things that we can accomplish together versus the things that we can accomplish on our own. Because I'm going to tell you right now that if I would have just written a book, it would have been just my story. It wouldn't be where we are today. It wouldn't be saving this many lives. And this book reinforces the reality that if we can get together with culturally competent therapists, many, many lives can be saved. And that's what I'll always take from this is how powerful a relationship can be with a trusted doc. And I trust doc with my life. And that's why our relationship will always be so powerful. I think what she says is through connection, we can heal, something like that. Absolutely. I would say when we when we connect, we survive. Michael and I connected. And the writing of this book was how we hoped to scale insights and hope to close the gap in our respect and understanding between these two groups of people. 
And that's what a lot of this was about, to really try to heal the divide that now exists between people, good docs that want to support, civilians that genuinely care, and the people that defend and support them in ways they're not even aware of. Thank you to Doc Shauna Springer and Michael Sugru. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. I found this book and this conversation very, very moving to me, and I hope you did too, especially at the beginning when Michael told the story about the African-American man that had approached him in his gym, and they had sat and talked together about really how much they have that shared experience rather than being so distinct from one another. Thank you so much for being here. I love bringing these guests here on Self Work. I'm very, very honored that they've asked or they've responded positively when I've asked for them to come on, and I hope that you enjoy them as well. Take very, very good care. Be safe. I'm Dr. Margaret. And this has been Self Work.